Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 31 uh, begins with a review of uh, the imaginary part of the K equivalent that we have seen, uh, we can obtain through the spectral analysis tool that we have developed. And as an example, we cite the Adam scheme, which shows the asymmetry in terms of instability near the inflow. And this um, uh, can be uh, at times cured. Uh, by introducing what is called as a buffer domain technique uh, near, which is used near the outflow. And the compact scheme interestingly enough actually mimics this buffer domain technique, because it has a tremendously high dissipation near the uh, outflow boundary. So, if we are talking about a propagation problem, the waves will uh, propagate through the domain and when it will come near the outflow boundary, it will be attenuated and that will uh, save lots of problem of wave reflection from the boundary, which seems to be a major problem of computing. So, this is uh, what we would be talking about. Uh, we also would uh, highlight that uh, the very often used uh, outflow boundary condition as a fully developed boundary condition um, is not always adequate, because it can lead to some kind of wave reflection. And if we have developed a method, which is stable for a wave that is propagating from left to right, then this reflected wave will be unstable with respect to that algorithm. So, this is a major issue that we will have to be working on. And then we will again uh, switch back to uh, the optimization uh, me method of Harasan Tesan in developing a scheme for a periodic problem. And once we uh, adopt this uh, optimum scheme of Harasan Tasan and add uh, Adam's boundary closure to it, we notice again that uh, the instability problem is retained. <coughs> so, this actually tells us that we need to do somewhat uh, better and we talk about uh, truncation error minimization as optimization problem by taking care of boundary closure properly. And we note that uh, we uh, use uh, the Fourier transform technique and uh, this uh, relates to its uh, property with respect to the impulse response and we will revisit this optimization problem with respect to white noise excitation only, because any other estimates will be a uh, less conservative estimate. So, white noise excitation gives us the outer bound. <coughs> Having defined the um, mean square error through this uh, norm, we can actually um, develop an example. Uh, that is what we will be doing, introducing uh, the optimization problem as a two parameter problem, which will be actually using the grid search technique uh, in identifying the optimum values of these two parameters. Uh, this will uh, basically conclude our discussion on uh, developing optimum scheme for compact scheme uh, methodologies. And having done that, uh, we also would highlight another source of error, which is not covered in the above, that is namely the aliasing error. This uh, happens whenever we uh, do include product evaluation, uh, either uh, in the transform plane as a, a linear equation or nonlinear equation. So, this is something that we will be talking about and we will uh, introduce aliasing as such. I think uh, we were discussing yesterday about uh, what is the role of uh, uh, the imaginary part of uh, uh, this k equivalent that we have here in this equation uh, 22. <coughs> you can see that uh, while calculating the uh, spatial derivative in an exact form, what you do? You multiply by i k, right. 
and numerically that this i k is represented by i k equivalent. Okay. If I have this i k equivalent split into the real and imaginary part, the imaginary part goes on the right hand side. Right. Hmm. If you look at the corresponding dissipative equation, okay. So this uh, is the source of dissipation here, and uh, <coughs> when I uh, write in the uh, Fourier spectral form, then I'll get del u del t plus t. <coughs> this is equal to minus nu into. This will give me k square, right? <coughs> so what happens is uh, you can see this uh, term appears here with a negative sign, right? So that's what have to look for when you obtain k equivalent by k and plot it versus k h, you look at the imaginary path, wherever you have negative sign that would give you a dissipative effect. If k imaginary is negative, that is the dissipative effect. If k imaginary is positive, then what we said yesterday would be that you would have a anti diffusive effect, right. So, that is what uh, we did uh, talk about, let us say this. Uh, uh, scheme here. <coughs> in this scheme, what you see here that for the point 1, point 2, and uh, point 4, that you see uh, <coughs> the imaginary part of k equivalent, all these three points you are seeing here, it is uh, positive. So, in a numerical uh, exercise, these three points, well, actually, it would show all the way up to the sixth point, if you see the sixth point is marginally unstable, that is slightly positive on top. So, all this first six points, you would see numerical instability. In the same way, if you look at the on the other side of the domain, j equal to 30, you have a massive dissipation. You can see these values and uh, this is j equal to 29 and you can see j equal to 27. So, what happens is near the inflow, if I am uh, solving this problem in a domain like this, let us call this uh, j equal to 1 and this is at j equal to 30. So, what we are seeing up to the first 6 points, we are uh, getting numerical instability. <coughs> And this on the other side of the domain, you would get to see very high damping, right. So, this is uh, what uh, I thought I will explain to you clearly, because I think after the class, we had a discussion and I uh, thought everybody would benefit if we. Uh, so, you can see the role of uh, the imaginary path, that is very uh, interesting. And um, this sort of portrait uh, uh, was obtained only when we could uh, basically um, <coughs> do a full domain analysis. If I do a local analysis, I would not be able to do it. In fact, uh, all the way up to 2003, many people have come out with local analysis and none of them could actually get a portrait of this kind and this was uh, shown uh, in 2003 for the first time with that matri matrix uh, stability analysis that we talked about in the last couple of lectures. Uh, we could uh, study the full domain uh, in one go and the reason that uh, we have chosen uh, this uh, model equation is pretty much obvious because we are trying to uh, take a uh, model equation which is uh, really non dissipative or non dispersive. So, if you are trying to test out your uh, scheme numerical method, nothing can be better than this. This provides a very uh, critical uh, test on your ability to uh, look at uh, uh, the dissipation and dispersion of numerical scheme. Okay. So, I suppose uh, this is what uh, we did talk about. Here we have talked about the dissipative uh, property of the Adam scheme and uh, what we notice that, uh, that it becomes more dissipative as you move towards uh, the outer part of the domain and interestingly enough this could be uh, very beneficially used in practical computing and uh, let us see how it is done through an example. What we are seeing here is called a receptivity of a flow 
uh, over a flat plate. What essentially one does here is excite the flow at a uh, fixed uh, amplitude and a fixed frequency and the flow is computed in the domain uh, guided by this inflow as well as the outflow here and what happens during the evolution of the flow is nothing but the growth of periodic disturbances that actually grow in space. <coughs> now, if you uh, excite the flow here, these are essentially unstable waves, physically unstable waves. That means, the amplitude keeps growing as you go downstream. <coughs> and uh, if you are talking about uh, computing such a flow, of course, one cannot uh, take an infinite domain because eventually this instability will lead this lamina flow into a turbulent state and even there we would not be able to know what the precisely the condition would be at the end of the domain <coughs> what we have called here is the outflow. What we notice that uh, this practicality of computing uh, which leads to truncating the domain to a finite size uh, forces us to consider the inflow and outflow inflow the conditions are unambiguous, but at the outflow we do not know a priori what the solution would be. And this is a, a rather a interesting uh, aspect of computing as compared to theoretical uh, aspect of uh, solving a problem, because in theoretical problem we always consider the flow in an infinite domain and we expect the disturbances to decay far away from it. And in contrast in computing we are always forced to take a finite domain and as I mentioned outflow is a major issue. <coughs> now, uh, because this uh, disturbance is growing downstream, if we abruptly end the domain here and uh, try to forcibly give some condition at the outflow that can lead to either a spurious reflection of this wave or an attenuation of this wave. If we could attenuate this wave that would be perfectly fine, then we could disregard a part of the flow where it has rapidly attenuated and retain the rest of the flow and that is precisely what one would like to do in an ideal situation. Now, if you look at uh, various uh, packages available, what one does usually is uh, called as a fully developed condition and in this fully developed condition what we do is we take the physical variable and we enforce its uh, streamwise uh, derivative equal to 0. Unfortunately, this uh, does not tackle a problem where we are talking about this kind of wavy nature. That is where we need to adopt what is called as sum of field boundary condition. If the wave is reflected back, then you can see what will happen now. If you look at your previous uh, uh, portrait here, what we uh, told here that uh, these are dissipative points right, j equal to 30 and 29, but this is dissipative with respect to a signal that is propagating in the downstream direction. Now, suppose I get a reflected wave, what will happen? It will be, ah, it, it will uh, have numerical instability. So, you can understand that in actual real life computation, it is so much important for you to appreciate the role of the numerical methods vis-a-vis -vis what you are actually computing. Suppose you are solving laminar flow or say fully developed turbulent flow, it is uh, not so difficult. Okay. When you try to study subtle physical flow, subtle physical effects like how uh, disturbances grow and uh, give you an unstable scenario. Physically, this, these are physical instabilities, right? These are not numerical instabilities that we are talking about. We are talking about capturing physical instabilities. Those are crucial tests. And if you do that, and if you are not very sure what you are going to do with this, you are going to get into serious problems. Actually, you will not be able to do anything. Now, what do you do? What people do, and people have found out that uh, you can create a layer of uh, the flow field, introduce a buffer domain, domain. So, what we are actually doing in the buffer domain, 
whatever this disturbances are coming in here will not allow it to grow. If we have the numerical uh, over stability like this serious damping that we have here. So, what will happen in this path instead of this wave actually growing numerically will attenuate it. And if we do so much that when we come to the end of the domain, the wave has artificially been damped out. So, there is no question of its reflection back inside again in the domain. So, this is the role that uh, buffer domain plays in actual uh, computation. Wherever you have uh, information propagating uh, via waves, uh, you may be better off uh, uh, artificially constructing the buffer domain like uh, what we have shown in the blackboard. Uh, but this uh, portrait tells you very clearly that the, this particular method or methods which actually display this kind of property near the outflow behaves like uh, a buffer layer for you because in the outflow path of the domain, any disturbances those are coming there, they will be severely attenuated and you will not have this problem. And this is uh, what uh, we just uh, said in the second. The amount of dissipation added uh, for this uh, outflow points are quite large and uh, this will work like a buffer layer used in many flow transition problems. So, I explained to you what this flow transition problem is. and. Uh, you can appreciate the utility of such a layer uh, that uh, basically will decay uh, perturbations to 0 at the outflow. So, have any spurious reflection from the outflow boundaries. This is a major uh, benefit that you can derive from the property of this method. Okay? Now, I think uh, we can go back to where we were yesterday and uh, we were uh, looking at uh, various uh, schemes. and. Uh, what we uh, were uh, looking at, how to improve the accuracy of the scheme and uh, uh, I uh, briefly mentioned about uh, these two uh, scientists work on uh, developing new schemes, uh, which had this following property, uh, it had very high uh, spectral accuracy and uh, you can uh, do it uh, very easily. So, the computational speed is quite fast. Uh, however, you must notice that uh, they also solved the same problem, the 1D wave uh, problem, 1D convection problem. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, what they did, uh, they started off from that equation that we wrote. This. Uh, This is the stencil uh, with which we uh, actually start working and then because they were uh, looking at a periodic problem, periodic 1D problem, then all you need to do is uh, tweak this to get you the accurate solution. So, this is applicable at all points, periodic problem, right. So, we do not have to worry about uh, near boundary closure and all this uh, issues have been sidestepped by considering the periodic uh, problem. <coughs> Now, what you do actually is uh, try to minimize uh, the error that is created by this compact scheme with respect to a spectral method over the full range and uh, then you can see that uh, departure is going to be a function of uh, this three uh, parameters alpha a and b. <coughs> and we have already noted uh, that uh, what we need to do is uh, we need to ensure this consistency condition to be satisfied exactly. So, this is what we uh, wanted. So, essentially then this objective function that you are setting up as the departure of the compact scheme from the spectral method, uh, there you have to satisfy this equation and from that uh, objective function you can derive two more equations to solve uh, this three unknown, right. And uh, they did that and they found that these values of alpha a and b uh, are this uh, uh, given by equation uh, this uh, relation 34 and you can see 
that uh, this is what we are anticipating that you do not have those fancy numbers you know rational uh, co quotient like um, i by j kind of uh, thing. What you get is truly real number and uh, these are very, very uh, nice uh, spectral property of the scheme and you can ensure uh, by looking at uh, that that this is uh, uh, valid uh, that 1 plus 2 alpha would be equal to a plus b. <coughs> okay. And uh, we noted uh, that uh, this has a much uh, better property than the six order scheme. Now, uh, what has happened in this optimization issue? We have only satisfied uh, the equality of u prime, right. So, what is the order of the scheme? Order of the scheme is, what is the second order scheme? So, even within the compact scheme, earlier we showed that compact schemes are much superior than the explicit scheme. Now, within the family of the compact scheme, what we are noticing here that if you do a careful optimization, then you are going to get uh, a much better uh, uh, resolution uh, of this uh, second order scheme as compared to the six order uh, scheme proposed by Adams. Right? So, this was uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, if we now uh, do one thing that we uh, try to investigate uh, how this uh, scheme will function. Suppose, if I want to solve a non-periodic problem, right. So, if I want to do the non-periodic problem, what I could do? I could borrow those boundary closures that has been given by uh, Adam's scheme and we have already noted they are fourth order accurate schemes. So, as far as that order uh, accuracy is concerned, it is not uh, going to go any inferior because your basic interior stencil is second order, but you are giving fourth order boundary closure for j equal to 1 and 2 and n minus 1 and n. And then what happens is uh, you get uh, this picture. Now, this may look slightly better than the Adam scheme, but it still you can notice for j equal to 1, j equal to 2 and uh, all the way up to j equal to 6, you are going to numerical instability because the imaginary part is positive for this first six points. So, what happens is, um, Haras and Tassan scheme uh, was a eye opener in a sense that it uh, does open up uh, possibilities of developing schemes with very high resolution. Why do we say high resolution? Now, you see Adam scheme we had uh, k equivalent by k the real path was close to 1 up to 1.5 and after that it started falling off. Uh, but you notice here for the interior stencils the middle of the domain if you leave out the uh, boundary points then uh, it remains flat all the way up to about 2.2, 2.3. So, maximum you can go up to pi and uh, this scheme actually helps you go all the way up to of the uh, theoretical limit right. So, this was a uh, good thing, but uh, still uh, we uh, noticed that despite its uh, excellent spectral resolution. Uh, imaginary part actually shows a large instability for those uh, uh, inflow part of the domain and uh, we do get uh, intermediate wave numbers uh, where you have large instabilities and milder instabilities uh, at uh, extreme wave number uh, for j equal to 2 and for j equal to 5 this instability property actually uh, starts coming down. Okay. <coughs> But uh, that leads us to making a confession that you are still not ready to use it for practical application because the numerical instabilities uh, are there. Uh, however, this analysis uh, tells us the efficiency of the optimization process and we could perhaps uh, exploit it and that is what uh, we can do. <coughs> okay. uh, what we would do is uh, let us say uh, that uh, we are trying to find out the first derivative by by optimization process. So, what we could do is uh, we could uh, obtain the exact uh, uh, representation of the first derivative as L of k h and uh, the corresponding discrete uh, uh, representation is L h of k h. Then uh, we can find out uh, this L 2 norm that we have uh, talk, been talking about. So, basically uh, what we are doing we are finding out the uh, mean square departure of the error and uh, this is uh, obtained at uh, let us say at the jth node. So, this is a local property. So, what we could do is we could uh, sum 
such departure across all the nodes in a domain and we can uh, construct a global uh, objective function which is sum of all this and this is what it would look like. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, what happened in Haras and Prasant's exercise? They were solving uh, this problem with periodic boundary conditions. So, they took some initial conditions and those initial conditions were kind of uh, restrictive in a sense they were band limited. Um, what one could uh, perhaps do is uh, make that uh, restriction also disappear. So, what you do is you take u of k as equal to 1. What does u of k equal to 1 mean? I think this is something also I wanted to discuss with you because I noticed that um, uh, not all of you are familiar with the, the property of uh, Fourier transform. So, if I uh, just uh, briefly state that if I have a function here, if I have a function here uh, like this, uh, then of course, I can plot its uh, Fourier transform and and I would perhaps see if it is a Gaussian, then it will also be a kind of a Gaussian. Okay. This is a very nice well behaved function, the Gaussian functions uh, form a member of Hermitian functions. They have this unique property that the original and its transform has identical uh, appearance. However, uh, if I take a function like this, a periodic function, what do I get? So, what would be its uh, transform here? Its transform would be given by the wave number, right? And what it would be? It would be a delta function. So, if this corresponds to k naught, then the spike in spectral plane is also at k naught. Okay. That if in the physical plane the function is all pervading, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, in the k plane, it is very localized. It is present only in one point. Now, uh, if I uh, look at uh, the other extreme, that uh, in the physical space, I have a delta function, right? So, if I have a delta function, let us say at x equal to x naught, what will I get here? you will get what is called as a white noise. You will get this f of k is equal to 1 everywhere. That means what? All the wave numbers are equally excited. Now, you will understand that uh, in all those uh, high school experiments, when you started doing all those um, vibration of a pendulum, what did you do? You always gave a impulsive excitation, right? You took the pendulum in one point and then let it go. So, that was like this, an impulse that is imparted into the system. The moment you impart an impulse, what it does? It excites all the wave numbers and frequency in the system, so that you are not doing any discrimination. So, what will happen? Your input to the system is equally spread over all wave numbers, all frequencies. And then what the system does, system actually picks up the natural frequency and displays it. That is what you see, the pendulum eventually settles down to its natural frequency. So, you have already done it. So, what you are seeing that um, if you have a very localized disturbance, that is uh, going to be a very, very tough uh, condition case for you to consider, because now you can see all k's are excited. And so, when we are also going to do this optimization business uh, exercise, what we are going to do is uh, instead of u of k square, I, we just simply put it equal to 1. So, what we are doing, we are not discriminating like Haras and Tassan. Haras and Tassan may have uh, done something like this, a band limited uh, thing. So, what happens that becomes, that optimization becomes somewhat like a problem dependent exercise, it is restrictive. So, we wanted to restrict that and we did that and that is what you see in equation 36. We have put u of k equal to 1, so that we can talk about the toughest possible problem that you can have. 
okay <coughs> now um, okay so this is what i have been uh, talking about so this is what is explained now what you notice here l of k if i am obtaining the first derivative what is uh, l of k h going to be it's operating on u right so this actually give me in k space as i k u right that that's our theoretical estimate of the derivative so for each k all i need to do is take the transform multiply by i k and uh, that's what we are going to substitute in uh, uh, equation 37 here l of k h i'll just simply write it as i of k <coughs> now uh, what about this uh, the discrete operation if you recall yesterday we wrote it as i k equivalent u right and this we wrote it as that is your i k equivalent and then you multiply and this uh, itself um, p l j we wrote it as the real part the imaginary part like this okay so that is uh, this part times e of k so this is how uh, we write in equation 37 uh, the expression for uh, the theoretical estimate of the derivative and this is the corresponding numerical estimate of the derivative and you substitute that and uh, work out uh, the details so this is how it would look like right C J L into R L J, and the imaginary part will be I times C J L I L J minus K H, and this is the uh, uh, <coughs> this is a complex number. So you take its uh, multiplied by conjugate, you get a squared quantity, and that's what is, is going to be your uh, local uh, optimization function G of J. Uh, well, uh, there is a bit of uh, algebra involved. You can go through it, and uh, what you find. that everything uh, depends on what now your numerical method that fixes the c matrix and once you have the c matrix this is what your uh, optimization function is going to look like okay so it involves if you are looking at the jth node uh, it involves some constant part that of course comes from this part l of k h part that uh, gives rise to this uh, first two terms and the rest of the term comes from uh, this numerical ap approximation of the derivative and it comes out in the following three groups the way we have written down uh, <coughs> uh once corresponds to the node itself so cjj square and uh, then uh, we have uh, this uh, type of product term which involves interaction of uh, the neighbors of the j uh because you see we are uh, restricting it to l not equal to j so it is summed over l uh, equal to 1 to n exclude that j is equal to j is uh, written out uh, separately okay uh, in addition we have uh, this kind of term where cjl is divided by l minus j so now if uh, if you are focusing on the jth point you notice that uh, if cjls are non zero they are going to be affected by all the uh, neighbors right uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, what we get now you can uh, actually use this uh, representation or this formula for any particular method you choose uh, provided you know the corresponding c matrix okay so that's uh, the clue now uh, we have also noted that in general for a general discrete scheme Uh, c is uh, essentially equal to a inverse b uh, however if you look at uh, explicit scheme a matrix is the identity matrix so c is equal to b and uh, you also notice that uh, the thing is error so this gj is some kind of an error so gj actually scales with n more you have larger the number of points the error will be more so it's it's somewhat little counterintuitive because we are given to believe that we 
uh, refine the grade more and more, error will come down. But uh, you are noticing that n comes here as a scaling parameter. So, actually g j uh, is directly proportional to n. So, n increases, the error also would increase. Uh, that is uh, that. <coughs> and you also notice uh, one effect for this, uh, that uh, this is a square term, right. So, this you cannot minimize, you know, you cannot choose uh, any particular uh, C j j uh, for which your g j can be reduced, except the condition that you choose the C j j itself as 0, right. So, if C j j is are 0, if I construct the C matrix and if I maneuver to get C j j equal to 0, then uh, that would be a good thing to happen, because that will minimize g j. Uh, this one is also a quadratic uh, set of term and this will also not going to help you much, because that uh, we have uh, neighboring points uh, on either side, they come in a anti-symmetric form. So, this is also a square set of forms. So, so this will not uh, be able to get you uh, any way by which you can minimize g of j. The only thing that will allow you to minimize g j is this uh, term, okay? this uh, second term that, that would be what you can uh, actually do. <coughs> okay, so, that, that is the nature of the term that you are seeing okay? and you can also very clearly now see uh, uh, that the way this neighbors uh, of uh, jth point contribute. The next point would uh, B would be j plus 1. So, L minus j would be. So, that uh, quantity would be what? Uh, depending on L minus j is plus 1 or minus 1, you are going to get a minus 1 sign. So, the next uh, points on either side of the jth node, they actually reduce. And uh, the very next point, again you are going to see that uh, uh, this will become positive. So, we will have to uh, probe a little uh, closer and see what we get. Okay. The first and foremost is uh, you can see that if this quantity is uh, going to be minimized, uh, it would be in our interest to keep the scheme as compact as possible, because more number of C j s are involved, C j l s are involved, they can uh, give you a constructive as well as destructive uh, interference. So, we do not want it. So, uh, in a better uh, way, it should be that uh, that the immediate neighboring points produce the maximum effect because it is divided uh, by L minus j, right? So if I look at the second point, it will be half. L minus j equal to one is the it is going to give you the most contribution. L minus j equal to two, it will reduce the contribution of Cj, and so on and so forth. So that's what uh, we note here that uh, this should keep. Uh, uh, our scheme as compact as possible, because then we would be able to minimize that. So, uh, if you now uh, look at those uh, set of terms, uh, look at the contribution coming from L equal to j plus 1 and j minus 1, uh, that is this contribution given here, 4 times C L L minus 1 minus C L L plus 1. <coughs> so, thus to minimize g j, we must have this uh, uh, point to the right should be positive and the point to the right should be much greater than point to the left or the point to the left must itself be negative. Okay. So, what happens is uh, to uh, not a compact scheme, but to the explicit scheme C itself is B matrix, right. So, the B matrix are chosen by us. So, we can see what happens. <coughs> And you notice that uh, uh, inspecting the B matrix itself, we can talk about least error schemes. And we have already noted that uh, we want to do something, the diagonal term should be equal to 0. And that is what you get in all central scheme, right. If I look at the jth node, I always put that coefficient equal to 0. So, that is uh, something that will tell you why central schemes are preferred. Central schemes uh, inherently gives you Cjj equal to 0. Whereas, if you now look at uh, say second order central difference scheme, 
So, C j j is 0 and these are what you get C j j plus 1 is plus half and C j j minus 1 is minus half and you can work out that expression and this is what you are going to get <coughs> for the uh, second order central scheme. Now, if you look at the corresponding fourth order central reference scheme, uh, you notice that uh, C j j uh, is once again 0 and then next neighbors are two thirds and the subsequent neighbors give you a contribution of which is 1 by 12. And you can see now, uh, look at the expression given in 42 and 43 and you can uh, very clearly uh, note that a fourth order scheme uh, is a better scheme than uh, this as a quantitative estimate because there we are subtracting uh, 3.5, you are subtracting a 4.76. So, of course, the uh, fourth order scheme is better from this uh, analysis point of view also. Okay. Now, uh, if we now come to uh, optimizing a compact scheme for first derivative, we can actually follow the route uh, which uh, Lele had taken earlier. And uh, what he did was of course, uh, try to obtain a fourth order internal stencil. So, that is uh, the stencil given here in 46 for internal points starting from j equal to 3 to j equal to n minus 2. Uh, for j equal to 2 and j equal to n minus 1, we can use that same uh, fourth order scheme we talked about. This is a central scheme. So, this uh, points towards the correct direction, whereas uh, at j equal to 1, uh, we do not know what to do. So, we uh, write the scheme like this. So, for j equal to 1, we say the derivative at the first point is related to the derivative at the second point with respect to this uh, <coughs> coefficient alpha and on the right hand side in the function value, we take uh, 4 points because uh, uh, our experience in the 80s have shown that uh, we could uh, do a upwinding scheme for this uh, j equal to 1 point and that should be okay. So, basically if I look at this, uh, I could uh, try to get this a, b, c and d here in terms of alpha and the same way I could get uh, a 1 and b 1 in terms of alpha 1. Then what happens is uh, my uh, optimization function uh, exercise would uh, be function of alpha and alpha 1. Okay. This is uh, what uh, uh, was attempted there. So, we could do that as I said that with the help of the stencil given at the first point and equating the Taylor series coefficients, we can work out this expression for a, b, c, d in terms of alpha like this. Okay. This gives us a uh, third order accuracy, right? whereas the internal stencil uh, we can uh, work for fourth order uh, accuracy and we uh, can get a 1 and b 1 in terms of alpha 1. So, what happens is the global optimization requires uh, uh, basically looking into alpha alpha 1 space and which we can do it because now we can estimate uh, g j at uh, alpha and alpha 1 and <coughs> one thing you notice though, if I go back uh, here, uh, look at uh, this uh, equation. This equation uh, is written only for one point whereas, this equation we have written it for uh, many, many points. Okay. Now, you look back to what you did in your uh, exam or in elliptic equation. We have uh, seen that one of the attribute that we must uh, try to do is to keep uh, the corresponding linear algebraic equation diagonally dominant. So, what that would do? That uh, gives you some limit on the value of alpha 1. right? What should be that alpha 1 then? It should be less than half if it is less than half because you see diagonal uh, term has a coefficient 1. So, and the off diagonal term have uh, give you a contribution of 2 alpha 1. So, 1 plus 2 alpha 1 should be means 1 minus 2 alpha 1 should be positive. So, alpha 1 has to be less than half whereas, uh, this um, point is only applied at one point and we do not perhaps uh, need to be that fussy about uh, the diagonal dominance and with it says that alpha should be equal to less than 1, but if we violate um, also that uh, marginally it should not cause tremendous problem. 
Okay, so that's what uh, we make the point here that alpha one should be less than or equal to uh, half, so that uh, we get the corresponding A matrix as uh, uh, dominant, and we should be able to use uh, Thomas algorithm without any problem. Uh, the same logic requires that alpha should be less than one, but we can still obtain the C matrix with this uh, condition mildly violated, and this is what we are going to show. What we are going to do is we are going to obtain this value of uh, g that we have shown in the bottom of this uh, slide and uh, plot this g uh, in alpha alpha 1 plane. <coughs> so, that is that. So, basically uh, we are showing you uh, this uh, 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 error uh, that optimization function g global optimization in alpha alpha 1 plane. Uh, what you notice is uh, along this uh, groove, uh, the function actually goes up. So, instead of uh, having a maximum uh, along this line, you get this uh, going to be very, very large. <coughs> Whereas, a optimum value uh, somewhere here, somewhere here in the middle. Okay? <coughs> and uh, this is also the region uh, where your uh, diagonal dominance actually break down. So, that is uh, estimated here also that if you calculate uh, you see the corresponding errors are also going to be very large. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, so having obtained this value of alpha and alpha 1, uh, we have for the whole domain with non periodic boundary condition. How does it function? Well, uh, you can uh, plot it, you can plot it uh, uh, the real path k equivalent by uh, k real path in the k uh, h or k delta x plane and you can see various points behave like this. So, this is your j equal to 1 point and these are the other points. You see a slight overshoot here and some bit of uh, degradation here for uh, close to the boundary points here. So, those uh, uh, we have shown only half the domain. So, I uh, we did not show the later half of the domain. So, that is what uh, we are seeing that uh, this is the real path. So, uh, we, we, we do see that uh, there is some benefit. However, uh, if you plot the imaginary part, this is what it is and this is not very en encouraging at all, because you can see uh, j equal to 1, you have uh, very severe instability for any k h above 1.5, right. And if uh, j equal to 1 uh, is not also considered important, then uh, you look at j equal to 2, 3, 5, etcetera, they are also selectively, scale selectively unstable. For j equal to true, perhaps all wave numbers are unstable. For j equal to 3, you will see that high wave numbers are unstable. And j equal to 5, you see a very interesting thing. The There is an intermediate range over which it is, uh, over which it is uh, unstable, that, that is followed by another intermediate range where it is stable. Again, at uh, very high wave number close to the Nyquist limit, again this is uh, going to happen. Okay. So, uh, of course, uh, we should not be surprised because we did not put any constraint on the g to avoid numerical instability, and we are paying the price here, right? So, if we don't have any constraint on the g, uh, we end up uh, developing so-called optimum scheme, which will have numerical instability. So, I suppose. Um, uh, <coughs> We uh, now have come to realize that even when we are trying to develop uh, compact schemes, and if we keep the stencil like uh, what we have done here, uh, what we have here, the basic stencil is uh, given here, right? And they are central, right? So central schemes uh, uh, appears to be uh, uh, not uh, holding up a lot of promise for us. So what we could do is uh, we could <coughs> Look for the alternative should be able to develop schemes for uh, uh, under the umbrella of compact schemes, right? So uh, what we are going to do is uh, basically uh, try to develop some upwind scheme. However, we need to uh, really talk about another uh, source of error which we have uh, uh, kind of avoided talking about so far. We uh, 
do not think we can uh, postpone it any longer and that sorts of error is what is called as aliasing error. <coughs> now, this is something I need to spend some time. Uh, now, is that uh, as compared to uh, this uh, convection equation, if I uh, try to solve it in a um, grid which is uh, non uniform. So, basically, what we are talking about that I have a domain like this. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, say I know that initially I have uh, structure in such a way that I need to resolve it and I need to uh, have, let us say, grid like this. So, we talked we talk, uh, talked about it before also that if we want to use compact scheme and in a non uniform grid what we should be doing well we would uh, transform the x plane into a transform plane which i'll call it uh, xi this uh, i should uh, divide it by del x del so, basically, uh, if that is your x plane in the xi plane, I would have uh, uniformly spaced point. And now, whatever we have developed so far, we can use them, right? Because they were all uh, developed for uniform spaced point. So, if we do this, um, what has happened now? Now, you see, this is a quantity that is a function of xi independent variable. In addition, this transformation function that we have uh, tried to get, so x is a function of xi. <coughs> if we may actually do it analytically, we may do it numerically, but we will have to get what is that? It was a sort of a linear term, right. But what has happened now here? It has become a product of two functions and a product of uh, two functions uh, dependent on xi, how do we represent it in a sense uh, of uh, uh, in the k space. This is what uh, we anticipate. <coughs> Let me write for uh, simplification of uh, that this is f of xi. And let me call uh, one of uh, del x del xi, uh, let me write it as z of xi. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I am uh, writing this, I could write it as f of k, let us say e to the power i k xi d k, right. That is the uh, definition of uh, Fourier transform. Let us uh, write this as dummy variable I change it to g k prime and e to the power i k prime xi d k. Now, what we are trying to do there, we are trying to solve an equation of this kind. Right? Now, what happens? Uh, this is where we actually get into a bit of a problem now. Now, if I am trying to estimate f times g, Right. So, uh, what we are noticing that this product, if I may call this as p of xi, I could write that product function p of xi would be some, let me call that as p of k bar. Okay. 
Now, what has happened here? K and K prime. What, what is its range of variability? The Nyquist limit that we need to do here. So, we will be writing here say minus k max to plus k max. So, what happens to this? This shows a variation, this phase variation is shown here as minus 2 k max to plus 2 k max. But given a grid, can I do that? We cannot, because our grid is capable of handling only from minus k max to plus k max. But uh, trying to take the product, we see that we are trying to spill out of the region. What, what happens? I have already told you what happens in computing. Even though we are working in a limited region, we always take its periodic extension on either side. right? So, if I am uh, trying to uh, resolve a problem from minus k max to plus k max and in the process I spill out to say minus 2 k max to plus 2 k max, what happens to this region? They cannot physically stay there. Okay? At the same time, this problem is repeated. Right? So, what, what does it mean? That what we are seeing from minus k m to plus k m, the same thing should have happened here, minus 3 k m to minus k m. Right? So, this point are what? This points have a corresponding image inside here, because they are the periodic extension. So, what happens is this point would map first point here, that should be the first point here. So, what happens to this point? This point would this point. So, what has happened is the one that is uh, supposed to be have gone there, numerically it will be transposed to this region. The same way this part also would map in this way. This part would so, anything that spills out, it is reassigned in a new region, new point. And this is something you must uh, have to uh, uh, understand that what is happening now is some component of the product cannot be resolved properly and they have been given a new name. This is what we call by aliasing. Right? Elias means that, you know, all those uh, bad people, they have some nicknames which we call as X alias, Y alias, Z. So, this is also something happening very bad here, which should not be kept, but we are pushing them and contaminating the good region where we do not have error. So, this phenomena is called aliasing error. Okay? So, we will we'll talk about it little more on the next class. This is a major issue and it is not uh, very trivial. Okay? So, we will uh, talk about it.